just, just a way of very brief introduction. Uh, Bondafun Associates that you see in the left-hand corner of, of your screen is a consultancy that I founded that represents Portal's Global Consulting Group on the African continent. Portal's Global Consulting Group is USA-based and mobilizes capital from Western markets into emerging markets. And we look after Africa here. So if we can just go, go on with the, the, the content of the day. To the next slide, please. So what we'll be discussing, um, just by way of a very quick overview, is we'll first think about the university as a human body, and then look to understand what are the challenges with state funding models, which then lead us into the Benice funding model, which we have developed, which looks at uh, value propositions, what are the challenges um, to conventional approaches in fundraising, and how we can start to introduce this Bernice funding model through enhancing culture, capacity, and capabilities of universities. So now starting, thinking of the university as a human body. I think we can all agree that the head of this body would be the academic research and teaching and learning that is conducted at the university. The hands, we are arguing, is the community engagement activities that the university does. But now I want to talk about two other organs. First, the heart. I think we can all agree that the heart is well understood to be essential to the functioning of the human body because it pumps the blood that keeps us alive. Another organ, though, is the appendix. There's a debate about the appendix. At best, by some, it is viewed as a backup to the immune system. It doesn't do anything on its own, it just supports. At worst, some people think the appendix is obsolete. It's from a bygone era, an earlier form of our uh, evolution and is pointless and is often removed. Next slide, please. So with that metaphor in mind, I then ask you to consider in your university, how is fundraising viewed? Is fundraising viewed as essential to keeping your university alive or is it viewed as a backup for a sick day because government funding, and as was articulated, you've got the Ghana Education Trust Fund in Ghana, you've got the Tertiary Education Trust Fund in Nigeria, the National Student Financial Aid Scheme in South Africa, and a couple of others. And so is it that these government schemes are seen as what is really essential and the fundraising within the university is a backup or worse still, is fundraising in your university seen as an obsolete function? And so my question for each of you to consider as we embark on this negotiation is in your university, is fundraising considered the heart of the organization or is it merely an appendix? Next slide, please. So now here's the challenge. The challenge is that African universities that are heavily dependent on state funding are very vulnerable to the dynamics that influence state funding. Most of our African, um, African economies are typically correlated to global commodity prices, whether agricultural or metals and minerals. And so as they go up and down, and there's a very clear case now with the Ukraine war and its impact on oil, fertilizer, and so forth, then our economies become vulnerable. When our economies are vulnerable, our national treasury that funds universities then has a challenge. Other considerations. A lot of our economies have to bail out state-owned companies, the parastatals that uh, provide essential services. That is a drain on the fiscus. Population growth means there's more mouths to feed, more infrastructure to build, a drain on the fiscus. Historical student debt, typically unpaid, a drain on, on the fiscus as well. And what's also important, as was articulated earlier, is that the cost of funding for higher education has typically not kept pace with the cost of study, nor the growth of inflation, um, the growth of enrollment, nor typically even kept pace with inflation, right? So what this then tells us is that funding solutions that are heavily dependent on the state leave universities to be vulnerable in the far future. However, there is a solution space in which we're given precedent from the US and the UK 
as to how can we think about how do we take forward funding for you universities. Next slide, please. So from, from 1982 onwards, uh, well, first prior to that, in fact, UK universities had been warned, it is unsustainable to keep on funding you at the level at which we're funding you. It was called the Universal Grant uh, Council. And they were told it's unsustainable to keep on funding you like this. You've got to start engaging in your own funding. And they heard this, but there was a bit of denial as to whether or not this threat would ever be acted upon. Then in 1979, Margaret Thatcher came into power and there was a very ideological stance that the state mustn't keep on funding. And so she created what I'm calling a policy shock with a sudden cut in state funding um, to, to reduce state dependence. And immediately this caused a series of uh, problems for, for universities. Uh, it was the removal of tenure of professors, staff to student ratios doubled, departments usually in the humanities, philosophy, sociology, development studies, et cetera, then shut down. And students uh, began only pursuing degrees like accounting, medicine, law, engineering, which had immediate uh, employability prospects. And the core of a university, which is the pursuit of intellectual inquiry, began to then fall away. By contrast, USA Ivy League universities broke with the church and the state in the late 19th century. It was largely ar around religious grounds as the universities were becoming more secular. And they immediately turned to benefactors and rich alumni to say, let's now review and build this university system anew. Now, they did not go through a shock like the English universities were to do a century later. And what they were able to do, and these three words are going to keep on recurring, was they were able to systematically build the culture, the capacity, and the capabilities that allow them to have a majority of their funding, approximately 75%, as self-funding. Now, this is the Ivy League, the private universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, but also large state um, uh, universities have also, looking to the Ivy League, also built the culture capacity and capabilities to self-fund. And so what we're now doing is we're proposing the Venice funding model for African uni universities, again, to build the culture, the capacity and the capabilities to self-fund. That will ensure that our universities can then be resilient into the far future while maintaining a focus on quality. Next slide, please. So this is now what we are calling the Benice funding model. And we're saying the Benice funding model combines the virtue proposition with a value proposition. So what do we mean by the virtue proposition? Universities typically articulate their virtue proposition to prospective donors. In other words, they go to a donor and say, we are doing the research that uh, advances society. We are doing the teaching and learning that produces accountants, engineers, lawyers, doctors that manage the society. And we do community engagement, like the online learning uh, that was spoken about earlier that reaches out beyond universities' doors. And so absolutely, universities have value to add to society in this articulated virtue. However, donor fatigue sets in and donor priorities even change. And so this is not a scalable fundraising model. And an example of this is here in South Africa where I am based. Several years ago, there was a great focus on what they called the NEAT generation. And by NEAT, they said, not in employment, and education and training. So young, unemployed people. And there's a lot of funding that went in that direction. Then a new president came in and the first lady had a particular interest on early child development. And because the first lady wanted to move to a focus on early child development, a lot of the money that people had thought about putting towards the neat generation suddenly went to early child development. 
it's a very fragile model, in other words, when you are solely dependent on donors agreeing with the virtue of what you're doing. So with that in mind, the Benice funding model seeks to add a value proposition to philanthropists, alumni, and corporations so as to increase their likelihood to pay because they receive a benefit themselves. So let's start with philanthropists. Philanthropists typically have their articulated interest as to what do they want to support. And if I can just name uh, two of the biggest ones because they're just the most well-known. Aliko Dangote in Nigeria has articulated very clearly he has an interest in manufacturing in West Africa. Now, if you now come to him with a, a proposal for him to fund something in medicine, you are more than likely not talking to his deep interests. Patrice Mutsepe down in South Africa where I live, he has articulated interest in mining and in football. So if you now come to him with something in basketball, or in um, uh, chemistry, again, you're unlikely to be talking to what he is interested in. So what we are saying with uh, the Bernice funding model is that we first start by understanding the philanthropists themselves. And then we then articulate a customized value proposition to that philanthropist that talks to their deepest motives so that you increase their likelihood that they're going to be interested in wanting to develop a relationship with you. And, ob and obviously also key in this is that your governance and your KPIs are world standard, which we can assist you with. So that's pillar number one, philanthropists. Pillar number two, universities do a lot of incredible research, most of which ends up on a shelf somewhere when somebody graduates or is just presented in a conference paper. Now we're saying, we have got a capability that can bring uh, the research to life in a corporate venture. And let me explain this by way of an example. A large telecommunications company, Safaricom in East, East Africa, MTN in South Africa and West Africa, wants to reach the far rural areas, however, because there isn't electricity supply all the way out there, it's very difficult to have reliable signal. But if a university is working on a battery technology, then there is the possibility to go to these large telecommunications companies and say, can you please fund the commercialization of this battery technology so that we can then help you as the large telecommunications company to be able to have signal in the far-flung rural areas where the state utility has not laid down uh, electricity cables. And so by creating that convergence between university research and corporate interest, we can commercialize research done out of universities and in the building of those businesses can create significant value for the university. The university quite clearly would retain all of the intellectual property of the venture. And the last pillar of the Benice funding model is with alumni. In here, we're saying we want to build a lifestyle loyalty program uh, with banks and brands that provide benefits, typically discounts, at each life stage of an alumnus for a fee. So there's obviously things that we, we get as students, maybe discounts in, in buying books as, as a student. In our early career, we're thinking about considerations like uh, getting good career advice at the early stages of financial planning, and, and perhaps we are fashion conscious and so we know we want to look contemporary, right? So by being able to bundle preferential pricing in all of these areas, the proposition to the alumnus is while you are still in an engagement with our university, it is still adding value to you after you've left. Mid-career, perhaps now you're thinking about the transition from being a specialist into general management. You also have family that you are now growing and you are trying to get uh, to be better at parenting. Uh, you are trying to see how to manage your wealth. And so again, by having 
a, a, a proposition that is lifestyle dependent to where you are in mid-career, then your relationship with the university continues at that stage of your life. Mature life, it's retirement, being in good health, uh, by pro providing propositions in that stage of your life, then your relationship with the university isn't three, four, six years of getting an undergrad and a master's, but it becomes a lifelong relationship with the university. And then the alumni will then have a propensity to support the university financially. It's an ongoing, mutually beneficial relationship. Next slide, please. So what are the challenges that uh, the conventional approaches uh, have to these, three, to these three groups? So very quickly, uh, universities, if they even have a record of the alumni, will send out newsletters of this is what's happening at the university today. And many alumni look at this newsletter, very disinterested, it is not relevant to them. And so they're not engaged. And so the question is, how do you nurture this base so that you can actually maintain an engagement and not have them disconnected from the university? Many philanthropists are very frustrated at just receiving proposals that have got nothing to do with what is of interest to them. Uh, and what that tends to do is they then tend to want to no longer talk to you at all. And so it becomes very risky to present to a philanthropist something that is of no interest to them. Commercializing research, and, and there's a particular case study out of a university that I'm just calling University W, where this university had the most incredible piece of technology where they've taken the X-ray and the ultrasound and merged them in one device. And this is fantastic for early cancer detection, uh, which most devices miss. However, this business has struggled to grow. And here's why. What a lot of researchers and universities fail to understand is that innovation is the combination of invention, which in this case, it is a remarkable, ingenious invention is separate to commercialization. The invention here is a combination of biology, biochemistry, mechanical, electrical, and electronic engineering in one device, brilliant. But commercialization is first the licensing and the patenting, which they did, but then it goes on to business considerations, inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing and sales, after sales service, and all the support functions, procurement, HR, payroll, accounting, that's now running a business. Now trying to run that business at scale so that it can grow across, across the continent is now a very, very difficult undertaking. What it requires is what I call the understanding that growing a business at scale is a bare knuckle full contact sport, like boxing. It's a bare knuckle full contact sport. If, if this, if this uh, invention wants to grow into West Africa, all the existing providers of x-rays in West Africa are going to say, wait a minute, these people are, are coming to, to steal our market share and they will want to respond. And so you have to have a capability that can deal with uh, the difficulties of market entry in new markets to grow a scale business. And it's also important to understand that some of the models that people use for commercializing uh, with licensing and patenting, that's fantastic. But a lot of these models are taken out of England for, for argument's sake. But England is a small country with very wealthy uh, consumer base, very close together. Whereas most of Africa is very big, uh, large numbers of, of people that are low income, very, very far apart. Growing a business in Africa is very distinctly different to growing a business in England. And so there's a need to understand the dynamics of growing businesses on the African continent, which is what we then bring to the, to the table. Next slide, please. Now, this slide needs a little bit of, of attention. So let's just go through it a little bit carefully, right? The bottom row of the table says advancement staff. 
And by advancement staff, we're talking about the number of fundraising people in the university. And so we have compared this across several universities. Boston College in Massachusetts, it's a small private college in Massachusetts, uh, USA. Michigan in Michigan State in USA. London Business School and three other South African universities that I'm just calling X, Y, and Z for now. Now, let's just look at, at this table carefully. If you look at South African University Y and compare that to Michigan, South African University Y has got 55,000 enrollment, which is similar-ish to the Michigan enrollment of about 50,000. But now go to the bottom line, which looks at the number of the advancement staff. South African University Y has 40 people in the fundraising slash advancement department. Michigan has 450 people, right? What are we seeing there? We're seeing that there is a significantly higher number of people in Sorry? Okay, I'll continue. There is a significantly higher number of people in fundraising in the American university than in the South Africa, right? And then now you look at the results, the endowment or the reserves. South African University Y has 22 billion South African rand in its reserves. Michigan has $17 billion, which is an equivalent of 305 billion rand. So that's an order of magnitude of 14 times. So there's, so, so there is a very clear distinction or demonstration that by having more people in fundraising, um, you are then able to get to more funds that, that are raised, right? And so just quickly, just going through this, we're saying US universities have shown that they have an engagement with their alumni of more than 60%. UK universities have grown to, from 2 to 4% since moving to, to self-funding models. South African universities, we, we have not yet studied universities in the rest of the, of the continent to get those numbers, but we know South African universities are at approximately the 2% level in terms of alumni engagement. So there's a huge opportunity uh, in terms of that engagement to be, to, to be bridged. And the next point is in these US universities, faculty, also leverage their networks in talking to the advancement team to say, I went to a conference, I met somebody that works at BMW, and uh, uh, that person can be helpful um, to help our fundraising efforts. And so there's a real understanding that they're all part of the fundraising of the university, which again is an opportunity for our African universities to then learn that it really is uh, a consideration for the whole university ecosystem to have this culture of fundraising that enhances the effectiveness of the advancement team. Next slide, please. And so we have um, this book. I just put the, the cover there, but I'm just showing it up um, uh, as well here. It, it isn't that big a book uh, that Professor Ngara, who happens to be my father, and uh, was a, a long time 30 year deputy vice chancellor of universities uh, has written in saying, this is how you undertake a major culture transformation within an institution. So in this book, he has articulated the blueprint of how you can undertake a major culture transformation within a university. And, and the important point here is, this requires bringing in the whole stakeholder group, senior management, faculty, professional staff, alumni, and even students into an understanding of the relevant contributions they can make to the fundraising effort. And naturally, these contributions must be appropriately incentivized for this culture to really take hold. Next slide, please. So bringing all of this together then, what are we saying? We're saying, it's going to be very difficult for any of us to go to our vice chancellor and motivate for 10 times the staff of the fundraising team. That's going to be a very difficult conversation. And so what we're saying is, we're going to help you to have a very different conversation. 
we're going to bring our portals on different team, our work which is managed on digital platforms, our relationships with private wealth managers and private banks, asset managers, and top four global accounting uh, uh, firms, uh, family office divisions. This combination will then effectively be the enhancement of the capacity and the capabilities for the university advancement team to be able to reach philanthropists and corporations so that we can augment the funding in the institution. And then by having this uh, culture transformation that has all those stakeholders, again, senior management, professional staff, faculty, alumni, and students understanding their relevant contributions to the fundraising effort, then we have changed the culture of the university. And we have moved fundraising from an appendix, a backup, or even an obsolete function to become the heart of the university. The blood that pumps in the university, keeping the university alive so that the university can retain its focus and even enhance the quality that the university produces. I thank you. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Ngara for such an insightful um, presentation on how African higher education can raise money or funds on their own via development. Indeed, this is very, very important. And I like how you introduce us to this new, uh, to this new model, which is the Bennis funding model, which uh, comprises of the philanthropist, alumni, and corporate commercialization of research. Um, that, that is very, very important because when you go to most African institution, uh, higher education institutions, there are lots of research which are lying down in their library with, without um, it being introduced to most of the corporate institutions out there. And when this is done, I know for sure that some money will be raised for the university. And also there are lots of alumni out there who wants to help their institutions, but how to go about it is an issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Ngara. It is now time for question and answer. So um, if you have any question or comment, you can raise your hand and then I'll mention your name. You unmute yourself and then you ask your question. I also go through the comments um, section and then the chat box. So, um, Okay, um, Mr. Nelson Ijumba, please unmute yourself and then ask your question. Yeah, yeah thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shinga Ingara, uh, for the very, very good presentation, very logical. Um, I mean, the, the Bernice model sounds so logical. You wonder why many institutions are suffering because of dependence on government funding. My question is, um, have you tried to engage any of the universities in Africa to adopt the Benis model? And what has been your experience in terms of either acceptance or resistance and what would be the reason? Thank you. So, so thank you very much for that question. So we are certainly at the beginning of this journey. Uh, we very deliberately chose to approach the AAU first uh, for reasons of uh, the AAU's uh, expansive reach um, in respect of you know, more than 400 universities in 30 countries. And what I'll certainly say uh, about the, the AAU was within 10 minutes of uh, our discussions with the, the AAU, uh, they saw the value immediately and hence set up uh, this, this discussion. There uh, are one uh, or two universities uh, in, in South Africa that uh, we have had a preliminary high level discussion with, and they are interested in, in taking the, the discussion forward. Uh, other universities, uh, 
perhaps have not yet had the, the time. And, and I think people are just very busy. Um, so they not yet had the time to uh, allow us to have a full uh, engagement with them, such as we're, we're having with you now, uh, so that uh, they could understand what the value could them what, what the value to them could be. So we're just hoping that through these engagements, we'll then be able to then facilitate um, uh, the, the the conversations to then take place. Okay, we have um, Ingozi Yunis. Can you also unmute yourself and then ask your question? Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask this question. Okay, we saw some universities in South Africa, in UK and the USA that are doing well in their advancement uh, departments. I want to ask, is it the Bernie's funding model that they are using? Or is there any other model they use to get to that extent? That's a very important question. So, so, so the, the answer is no. Uh, the, the, the Bernice funding model is something which we have just developed, which has effectively taken global best practice, if I can call it that, and then understood African realities to then say, this is what we see as the future of fundraising on the African continent. American universities have a particular modality, as I'm saying, they have very large teams. Uh, those teams are very strongly funded um, that, that they then you know, utilize to, to then uh, do their fundraising. UK teams, not necessarily as big, but keep in mind that the, the UK itself is a very small place. Small place with high concentrations of wealth means that uh, the fundraising modality uh, is different. So what we have done is we have said, what is relevant to our environment? And how do we do it in such a, a manner as to ensure that we can really be working with the realities on the ground of African, um, of African universities so that we can grow um, fundraising on the African continent? Great. Thank you very much. I'll read some comments and questions from the chat box. Um, so Kelvin, Mubiana is asking if your book is online to read. Uh, so the, the book is, is not yet online. Uh, it's actually still uh, about to be published. Uh, and I will just confirm uh, with Pro Professor Angara when exactly the, the, the publisher will then put it online, uh, but the, the hard copies are, are going to be on shelves, I think next month, but I will just confirm that. All right. Mr. George, Joel is also asking, how can one commercialize research? So very briefly, uh, I will just articulate the, the, the process flow of it. We first look at research. So let's just use a, an example. Let's say somebody has developed a particular cream, um, a, a particular cream for acne. And I'm just saying, saying something off the top of my head, right? The, the first thing we, we need to do is, is we need to say, okay, is there really a large market of people who have got an acne problem? And we first have to do a market assessment to say, yes, indeed, there is a large market of people who have got an acne problem. So that's the first tick. There actually is a market. Then once we've established that there actually is a market, we then ask the question, how are we going to reach that market? So will it be through social media? Are we going to put the cream in shops and so forth? So when we've established that we can reach that market, then we say, great, now how are we going to go into production? So which factories are we going to use? Uh, are we sure that all of the components that we use in the lab, we can get them at scale? What packaging are we going to use and establish um, that set of, of conditions? And in all of this, we're going to make sure that we license and patent so that the intellectual property remains with the university. Now having done so, now we just go out into the market, advertise aggressively, do production um, in, in the factory aggressively, organize the logistics and the transportation from factory to the um, 
uh, places where, where it is going to be sold. So it is an entrepreneurial activity. And that is why I make the point that innovation is invention times commercialization. Very often, a researcher who is very good at invention is perhaps not the best placed person for the commercialization. So we have to marry the researcher and an entrepreneur for the commercialization to then take place. I hope I've answered the question. Mrs. Alistair, see your hands up. Please unmute yourself. I'm oh, sorry. Please yeah, unmute it. Muted. I'm unmuted. Can you hear yes. me? Yeah, I can, can hear you now. Okay. I think the problem of Africa has to be solved by Africans. So I appreciate the Venice model. My concern is there's an issue about letting the students from their first year in the university into the culture of giving. So when they become alumni, it doesn't create any problem, it becomes part of the culture. But I'm afraid if students have experiences in school, that don't really make them willing to give is something that will really, really affect even at the alumni level. Because I know some students, even when they have left school, they feel so bad to say, I want to give to that institution because the institution may not have given to them what they desired as students. I think that's what we have to take seriously about what we give to the students to enable them to be willing to give. Thank you so much. This is an absolutely crucial point that, that has been, been raised here. So first of all, what I'll just articulate is that uh, giving, I, I, I use three T's for this. So there's the obvious T, which is treasure, as in money, but there's also time, and talent. And I think as we are starting to introduce the culture, even at a first year level, to say that as a student in our university, you are not only a person who is here to receive skills and knowledge and get a certificate, but you're a person who is a part of the society of this university and a part of the greater society as well. It's a very important developmental part of the formation of the citizen that comes out of the university experience. And so those for whom perhaps giving treasure is a bit of a challenge, they can certainly give time and talent towards uh, particular initiatives that contribute to how the university is engaged uh, in broader community engagement. And that will then definitely help to inculcate the culture that I am part of a collective. And in a very African context, we call this Ubuntu, right, in, in certain places. So, so I think it is, it is very important that the university experience for our students is expanded to the full formation of the individual, including the academic input for, for which they get a certificate. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, what a, it was a great presentation, actually. So I wanted to find out if the Benny's model has actually been used, if there are any examples where this model has been put in place and how successful it was. Thank you. So aspects of the Venice model have been applied in certain places, but this is now called the market uh, introduction of the Venice model as a, uh, as a whole model, very specifically relevant to the African continent, developed by people with a very deep understanding of Africa, 
both at a university level and in the market. And this was what was very important. Uh, a lot of people who have proposed things uh, in respect of fundraising beyond government have done what I call a copy and paste. And they've seen something that's done in the UK, the, the US, and then they've just tried to apply a formula without fully appreciating that there are contextual differences here on the African continent. And so what was very important in the work that we did in the development of the model was we said socially, academically, economically, what are our African realities? So that we can put together a model which can then really engage those realities and then be able to then uh, allow us to then, to then scale fundraising. So we are at the point, and it was very important, as I've said earlier, to engage a body of the esteem and the stature of the Association of African U U Universities, where we are now taking the model to market. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Please. Please continue. Yeah. Thank you yes. very much for that uh, wonderful presentation. I noticed one thing that stands out is the number of staff in the advancement office. You could see it, it's just outstanding because it, it, even with the population of uh, the uh, University of Michigan and that of uh, the uh, Y University in South Africa, that is quite close. You could see the difference in the in personnel in the advancement of And I ask, uh, uh, were you able to find out if those people in the advancement office are regular staff of the University of Michigan? Are they uh, uh, full employees of the university? And uh, how will the university manage the, 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 you know, the, the investment of them in terms of salaries, the monuments and all that, vis-a-vis -vis what they are uh, bringing to the university through alumni fundraising. Because I, ca I can see that it's really a, a lot of difference. You have asked such a pertinent question. So to first answer very directly, these are full-time employees in a very professionally managed uh, office, uh, that reports into the highest level of governance. And this was the point around that mm, metaphor between the appendix and the heart. They understand in Michigan, this is the heart. This is the lifeblood of this university. Because if the fundraising taps close, buying test tubes for laboratories, buying soccer balls for the sports fields, getting staff to, to fly to conferences around the world, all of those things will then drop back. So they are very, very clear that this unit is the heart of the university that ensures that the balance of the university is able to retain its focus on quality. So the first question to answer very directly, this is full-time staff, full-time employed staff. Now the justification of hiring so many people is why we then showed that their endowment, that is the amount of money they have in reserves, is 14 times what South African University Y has, right? So it's $17 billion, approximately 305 billion rand. So they've justified their pay because they raise a lot of money on an annual basis. And so what we're saying for the Benice model is, it's going to be very difficult to go to your vice chancellor and say, can you please multiply by 10 the number of people in the advancement department? So we're not asking you to do that. What we are saying is that by working with us, we have a digital platform that is connected to philanthropists. We are connected to corporations. Then we will be able to utilize our digital platform to reach philanthropists and corporations, number one. Number two, we will then work with the fundraising department, the advancement um, staff in the university to say, how do we reach your alumni? And then we will package the propositions, life stage dependent. When you're in early career, you want these things, 
We will organize the, the discounts uh, that make it attractive for you as an alumnus of the university to want to retain the association with the university. And that will then maintain the lifelong loyalty to mm -hmm. the university, right? So that they will then be in a position to fund the university because that affinity, that loyalty, that value in being, in having the continuous engagement with the university will be retained. Thank you. So can I go? So, so, so you start first with the raising that endowment fund. That's the, the first uh, uh, action, I, I guess, from what you just explained. So the, the very, very first, first thing, when we just take it into a, a sequential process, the very, very first thing is we would engage the university to do what we call a, a culture assessment to understand what really is the cultural understanding within the university around fundraising. What is the thought process from senior management and the balance of the stakeholders? That's, that's really the, the first thing. Because where we have to win is we have to win that influential stakeholders start to understand the greater contribution that they can make to fundraising and are given the tools to do so effectively and have the incentives to do so as well. This is crucial. Now, having done that, having this proper cultural map and cultural understanding, then we then now need to go and do some background work, if I can call it that. We need to go into the research to see what has been sitting on a shelf and can be commercialized. We need to go and look into the alumni records and different universities have got different strengths of alumni records. Some are very weak, some are very strong to say, what do you have? Do you just have names and the year they graduated or do you have contact details? We may need, for example, to uh, get a whole database of alumni names and then again, use our uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to find them on LinkedIn, find them on Facebook, et cetera, so that we can now create uh, a means of then communicating with them. So it's getting the repository of research, getting the repository of alumni, and then putting together how it is with, this, uh, with the research and the alumni, with the culture of the university now shifting towards fundraising, do we then start to um, uh, introduce those three pillars of that model? I, I, I hope I've been clear in, in how I've tried to answer that question. Okay. M may I go now, please? Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, Angela. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so thank you so much. And and you know, I, I love I love the the whole discussion with regard to looking at it from an African perspective and understanding the contextual um, factors and and. Um, I would say aspirations of, of African people, because we really need to look at that in terms of everything else. So it's the aspirations and it's the motivation. And really one has to think about, so why would I want to be involved in this? That's the one thing. Secondly, when, when we look at it and the fact that universities do have lists of alumni, et cetera, and there are people who, who do, um, provide funding, et cetera, to the universities, but not everybody does. Now, we really need to not look at the, uh, the, the, the end. We need to look at the beginning of the life of students into and with a university. And certainly, you know, it, it's not about the culture of giving and it's not about the culture of giving money. It's the culture of being with and working with communities, the resources that you have, and really the learning, the mutual learning and, and um, negotiations, whatever you may call it, but that mutuality where there is social justice, there's respect, etc. All those aspects need to be taken into account. 
Now, how do we work with that with our students right from the first day that they enter the university? And there are so many different ways in which this can be done. And it does mean that staff in the university need to rethink that it's not just about you providing content and you the knower of, no, it's about how we are working with communities from day one. And one of the, the aspects that we also focus on is to look at service learning and how we take service learning from the global perspective and adapt it within our particular context so that our students have an idea of the community organizations out there, what they are doing and how they can be integrally involved and engaged with communities for enhancement. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I literally have nothing further to, to add to that. And what, what Angela has really been articulating is the cultural transformation that uh, we, we were talking about. It's, it, th th there's a, a common mistake where uh, some people think that a new fundraising um, avenue is this add on at a distance. Oh, just give us more money from your friends. But what Angela has articulated very correctly is that it really is a cultural transformation within the university from the first moment of engagement of the student um, as they enter, also requiring of faculty that faculty also see themselves as more than dispensers of information. Uh, but also that they see themselves as people who are molding young people into being much stronger citizens of the society in which they find themselves. Brilliantly articulated, thank you. Right, Mrs. Ngozi, you need to speak and ask your question. My, it's not a question, it's a comment to add to what Angela just said. In fact, she has almost finished everything. But uh, another aspect I would like to add to it is the culture of tracking our students. When students leave the university, we lost engagement with many of them. We cannot say where our students are, what they are doing, at what time do they get employed, in which type of office they are employed. Because if we are looking forward to getting funding from them, we need to be at their back at all times. If a student graduated within one year, maybe the alumni office or any other organ can keep track of where these students are so that when we need them, we already we are their friends. You don't need further introduction. And then if you are let us say that as it is now, we work to work with uh, our students and we go to alumni office, and you pick an address of somebody that has not been employed and you are calling the person to contribute, what does the person have to contribute? So I am saying that tracking the students is very, very important. We should be able to say, within this number of years, this person has been in this company, this person is moving, this person is not moving. And how do we pack them? Because if somebody finds work or maybe somebody establishes a company, there might be some little, little problems that we can help the person solve through research to make the organization grow so that in time of need, you can be able to say, at least we have been, we have been friends, we have been collaborating, the university need this, can you help? That's my comment. Absolutely correct. And so the only thing just to add to that comment, because it's a very, very brilliant comment, is this is the necessity of the digital platform because the ability to uh, maintain records and continuously update them of 200,000 students is very difficult if you're doing it on an Excel spreadsheet. So uh, rather, let's have a, an intelligent platform that can find people uh, using you know, social media and all other indicators on Google, wherever somebody's name crops up, and then be able to dynamically update um, that uh, repository of information so that there is a very dynamic uh, understanding of where they are and also a very customized communication with them. Uh, I, I saw a question, but it 
disappeared very quickly saying, could you just articulate what the problem with uh, newsletters is, right? Now, a, a lot of the time, newsletters that are sent out are very general. Um, and that's fine to give a general uh, update as to what's going on with the university. But what's also necessary is to have something that is customized to the particular uh, individuals. So somebody like me, who was an engineering student and then moved into financial services, I would be very interested in getting information that is very customized around engineering and financial services uh, from my university. So, so in so doing, there would be the consideration around this really has continuous relevance to me where I am right now. And so again, that's something which for 200 or thousand alumni, uh, is very difficult to, to manage unless you're, you're managing it on a digital platform, which is a, a very core component of the proposition that we're bringing uh, with the Venice funding model. Ngozi, Eunice is back again. I don't know, maybe she has another question to ask. Yeah, please. Thank you for another opportunity to ask another question. Because this model is fantastic. And I believe that uh, if we can implement it, it might go a long way in helping us. So I want to ask, many of us here might not be in the university advancement team. Like myself, I'm not in my university's advancement team. Though I hope to share what I have gathered with the director. So I want to ask, has there been an effort to sell this model to advancement teams within our university? So, so again, this is really the, the beginning of that effort, right? So, 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 so you know, we, we built the model over several years. Um, just to give a bit of background, uh, eight years ago, uh, I personally did this. I went to the Middle East, to the US, to the UK, uh, to South America, to Asia, and I looked at all that was being done, the, the full suite, as it were. Uh, and um, you know, then began very extensive consultations and engagements uh, with stakeholders as to what really makes sense in our context uh, here on the African continent and what doesn't and why. And so there was a lot of very deliberate modeling, um, understanding as to what can and what can't work and for what reason. And so, and so you know, as we then uh, completed that work, we then came up with, um, with the Benice funding model as you see it uh, pre presented to you now. So now the, the question was, okay, there are more than 500 universities on the African continent. Am I going to knock on every single door individually? That is a, a very difficult way of engaging and it's inefficient. And so then the view was, let's then uh, engage at an AAU level because of the platform that the AAU has um, and its credibility and its gravitas uh, to, to begin this conversation. So, so we are really at the beginning of a conversation, what I hope is a collective conversation uh, around which we can then look to how are we starting to uh, revisit fundraising for our African universities going forward. So very specifically in your case, then I would literally be asking you to um, assist with uh, putting us in touch with your university's advancement team uh, so that we can then begin, begin conversations. So again, we're, we're literally at the beginning of this process after having spent years designing the actual model. Why is it called the Bernice model? And that is uh, my, my mother. Uh, she was um, very, very dear to me. Uh, and she was a, a teacher and teacher trainer. And so just in honor of her, um, I'm, I'm calling it Venice. Right, that's so interesting. Okay. Um, I've shared the presentation on the chat box, but then we also share with you uh, that email. So I encourage everybody to share their details on the chat box so that after this webinar, 
we will, we will have access to your email and then share the presentation to you. Um, since there's no more questions and there's no more um, comments, we will bring this webinar to an end. Um, I thank you all for joining and also Mr. Ngara for, for um, accepting to our request to, to be our speaker for today's webinar. Tomorrow, God willing, there's going to be another webinar on COVID-19. Um, the theme is effect and the effectiveness of African health system in managing pandemic. I'll urge you all to join. Uh, we have your emails now, so we are going to send you the invitation to, to register and then join tomorrow at 11.30 GMT. Thank you all for joining, and I hope to see you tomorrow also on our, on our subsequent um, webinar. Bye.